to um, welcome Professor Sir John Bell. Thank you, Steve, for hearing the boring bit. Um, so I've been told that I'm, I'm not here to recruit you to join Cap 3, okay? I'm here to just talk generally about our clinical trial work and about broader issues in relation to Lynch Syndrome. So I couldn't remember what my exact title was, so I kind of uh, made one up. Uh, so it's uh, Cap 3, Red, I do other stuff. Uh, so, uh, so in fact, I am going to talk about Cap 3, though I'm talking about sports. Anyway, so I just want to briefly um, talk a bit about genetics and about large-scale uh, stuff that we're involved in um, and remind you of the amazing technologies that are about to land on our doorstep. Now, you've all had lots of talks about genetics today, but I thought I'd stick two slides in anyway. So just to remember that, that um, in every cell of your body there's a nucleus, or almost every cell, and in that nucleus there's more than two metres of DNA which carries your genetic information all coiled up into things called chromosomes, 46 of them. Uh, and so if you unraveled it, you'd end up with two metres, that's more than my height of DNA in every cell of your body, which is quite an incredible um, fact that, that there's this huge source of information. And we can now sequence it. Now we've known about the double helix since 1953, or just before I was born. Um, or just after I was born, sadly, yeah. Um, and, um, <laughs> And then in the 1960s, the thing that hooked me on genetics was actually the discovery of the genetic code. So this is the genetic code. It took about 15 years to crack this. Because the question was, okay, so you've got these four letters. How do you write words to convey the information in your genetic code with an alphabet with four letters? What you need is something that explains how to put amino acids in strings to make proteins and enzymes, which is what your body's made of. And there are 20 amino acids that you need codes for. So if you sit in the bath and think about it, you realise if you've got four letters, you need to take sets of at least three to have enough codes to have 20 of them, some full stops. If you have words of only two letters long, you'd only have 16 combinations. If you have combinations of three letters, you have 64 combinations. That means that it's a degenerate code. We have more combinations than we actually need. Probably Francis Crick, when he worked this out, said he'd thought of a better way of doing it, but this was the go one God chose, so this is the one we're stuck with. Um, so essentially, what that means is that when you read your DNA, there's lots of variation in it that's irrelevant. So I've, I'll just look at one example here, which I'll be coming back to later. If we take the letters G, U, because this is the RNA message, so it's a U, not a T. So if you look at the GUA, what you end up with is a daily. But actually, if you look on the right-hand side there, if you put GU anything, you'll get a Bailey. Okay, so anything, the third position doesn't really matter. So that means when we compare our DNA, we're going to find millions and millions of differences that are, that are not going to change anything. So it's not straightforward to look at someone's normal DNA. It could be normal, but be different. But the other thing is, if we change in this set the second letter, if we change that second letter to a C, then, in fact, it doesn't matter what the third letter is, you're going to make a valine into an alanine. And that could be really important, or it might not. It depends where that particular building block sits in the protein. So it might be important, it might not be important. And our job is to work out which of these changes matter and which ones don't. The other thing that I wanted to, and I'll come back to the importance of, of, of sharing knowledge on that in a minute. The other thing that I find a lot of people have trouble with is this idea of the two-hit hypothesis. So in every cell of your body, if you've got Lynch syndrome, you have a faulty copy of one of the mismatch repair genes, and you've got a working copy. Whereas most people have two working copies of that gene. And in order to get a problem, you've got to take out both copies. Now, if you've inherited one faulty copy, you only need a second loss to get the problem. So I've been trying to explain this to for years, and I suddenly came, I was, in, I was at the football ground with my son two weeks ago, and I went for a beer in the shark bar, and I managed to persuade the bouncers on the door to let me take their picture. But it suddenly struck me that if you're explaining it to your family, it's all about having two bouncers on the door. So basically, most of us walk around not realising there's two bouncers on every door, checking the cells, making sure they're not out of control. The reason that it's a law in Newcastle to have two bouncers so that when one goes to the loo, there's still one left behind. Okay? Now, if in fact you have a pub with only one bouncer on the door, which if you've got Lynch syndrome, that is your situation. It still doesn't mean there's a problem. Because if the bouncer goes to the loo, 
it still requires some, you know, sort of spurs fighters to want to burst in at that moment to cause a problem. So you don't necessarily get a fight starting, it's just a bit more likely when you've only got one bounce from the door. <laughs> an, an image for you to take up. By the about middle of next month, the only thing you remember about my talk is that. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so. Um, so I got hooked on to genetics when, as a medical, before I was a medical student, I was told about the genetic code, and my biology teacher asked me to explain it to him on the way back from the lecture, which I was really chuffed about. Um, and that's why I took a year out of genetics, and I got into this for the rest of my career. Uh, but it's recently really started to emerge as a massive specialty. So, as you heard, I mean, there's actually more than 61 clinical geneticists, but there's only 61 whole time equivalents who do cancer genetics in the country. And so we are quite a rare breed, but clearly this is now a big issue because you can do whole genome sequencing on a scale never before imagined. So we, it, took us, uh, it took the world uh, about 15 years to do the first whole genome. Uh, and if you'd set off again in the year 2000 and tried to do the whole thing again, it would have cost about $100 million to do one whole genome or one person's whole genome. And then about seven or eight years ago, a guy on paternity leave had a bright idea. And, and he basically had the idea that if you did little bits of sequencing in what's called massively parallel sets, so you do lots of different fragments simultaneously and then get a computer to put all the bits together, you could do it much faster and cheaper. And so in 2007, 2008, Craig Venter and Jim Watson had their whole genome sequenced by two competing technologies. The following year, my dear friend Johan Den Dunnen had some spare capacity in his lab and Maya Lane, who's one of the clinical geneticists in Holland, volunteered to have her whole genome sequenced. And they did it for 45,000 euros, which is a pretty big cut in price from $100 million in 2000. Uh, the Americans were very unimpressed by this achievement, having already done Jim Watson and Craig Bennett, but the Australian uh, media picked up the concept, I thought, better when they said, man takes one step towards understanding woman. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a very small step, having been married for years, I can tell you. <laughs> Nothing whatsoever. Um, <laughs> But what this did was it opened a new era, which we're now feeling the full impact of, because it's now down to around about a couple of thousand quid to do a whole genome sequence. Uh, and it's continuing to fall. And so um, there were a bunch of us were put together in a closed room with no windows uh, to write a report for the government on this. And I was in charge of the innovation committee. And I actually argued against what they decided to do, but I was overruled. because. Once the government saw this report and what was coming, and we emphasized that this was a time of great austerity. In fact, we only put a half a picture on the front to emphasize how much we tried to save, <laughs> tried to save money for the government. Um, that they said, we're going, to, we're going to invest in this, and so David Cameron said, we're going to spend £100 million to do 100,000 whole genomes. Now, the mathematically astute among you will notice that it costs about 2,000 quid to do all the genome, and he's only given us 100 million. 2,000 times 100,000 doesn't make 100 million, so we're a bit short of cash. But you don't like to turn down an offer of 100 million quid, so you know, it was accepted. And in fact, other people like the Wealth and Trust have put money into this as well. And we've got a variety of genomic strategy boards at the NHS, in health education, England, etc., trying to make this fly. This company that was created is actually owned by the Department of Health. It's called Genomics England. And it has one share owned by the Department of Health and Secretary of State. And its job is to deliver this project. So this is going to have a big impact on some of the conversations we've been having. Because what's this, what this is saying is that industrial scales DNA testing is moving out into the NHS. It's no longer going to be 61 geneticists rushing around with a few counsellors. This is going to be routine business in the NHS. Now, even 100,000 isn't that many because, in fact, we'll have to do, in many cases, the whole family to solve problems of rare disease, both parents and the kid, for example. So that's only 30,000 or so families. But it's a huge step forward. So we're going to be able to order high-throughput sequencing on people with a variety of conditions that previously were unimaginable. Uh, even in our you know, wildest dreams, we couldn't have thought we could do this sort of thing. So to go back to my dear friend Jim Watson, who is the patron of our centre in Newcastle and comes to see us, so he might not come again now, he's getting very frail. Um, but Jim of uh, Watson and Crick fame had his genome sequenced and was analysed by Baylor, and this is what they found. So remember that degenerate code we had and all those missets. So he had in his genome, in this first pass analysis, 9,000, nearly 9,000 missenses where there's an amino acid swap and another 2,500 nobody had ever seen before. Novel amino acid changes. 
and he had thousands of other variations there, and lots of synonymous changes that apparently didn't change anything, but might have an effect anyway. You can see the problem that we face. We could spend, all of us could spend our entire lives working out what that lot meant. He's a guy in his 80s, and apparently nothing wrong with him. So we presume most of that is completely irrelevant. So the question is, how do you pull out of that the odd variant that matters from the vast number that don't? And that's why we need to pool our knowledge. And so the meeting I've just come from down in London has been addressing this because we are now heading for what will be the biggest traffic jam in history. This is the current biggest traffic jam in history. It was in China. It was 100 kilometers long and nobody moved for 11 days. So next time he's stuck in traffic, it could be worse. But the fact is that what we are heading for now is the biggest traffic jam in history. When we do 100,000 genomes, we're going to have 100,000 sets of data containing 3 million variants each. So each one of us has 3 million spelling differences that we've got to try and sort out. Somewhere in there are the single letter changes that might give you Lynch syndrome or hereditary breast cancer, and it might be one letter out of those millions of variants that makes the difference. Just to put this in hard copy land, uh, this is Patrick Chinnery who took over from me as the head of institute in Newcastle. And we're standing next to our exhibit, which is made by the Wellcome Trust, and we now have our visitor centre has in our, in, in, uh, across the street from us. So that's what your genome would look like if you printed it out. But if you look very closely, each one of those is a chromosome, and if you look at the one that's open there, that's the X chromosome. If you get a magnifying glass out, in fact, it doesn't matter how big I am, mean, you can't read it. That is what your genome would look like if you printed it out. So anybody who fancies a hard copy, you need reinforced floor, it's very heavy, uh, and you need some very good eyesight to read it. Now, I show you that to, and then I want you to think about the fact that the National Health Service in the United Kingdom is the world's biggest buyer of fax machines. <laughs> now, that's how we communicate with each other. You know, we all carry smartphones, but we talk to each other by sending each other faxes. Can you imagine what's going to happen when Ian Fraley decides to send a fax of someone's whole genome to someone in Swansea? I can't. Oh, yeah, I can in Wales, but I can't outside. That's true. Yeah. Really? Fortunately, because it would take about 400 years to actually fax this to someone. So, this isn't just about the machinery and the analysis, it's also about the logistics of the IT. How are we going to use this stuff in real life. So there's a huge barrier uh, ahead of us that we have to overcome. So what we need is to pool knowledge. Uh, and I'll just uh, give you a couple of examples of how I hope we can do that. This is Kathleen and Christy, who I saw about two weeks ago, and they very kindly agreed to give their picture for me for teaching. Now, they in fact don't have Lynch syndrome, just to prove I don't just spend my life talking about CAP3. Um, these, they have a family history of breast and ovarian cancer. And Kathleen on the right there had a, a breast cancer, and she was tested, and she was found to have this amino acid change. Let's remember I showed you at the beginning? Valine to alanine. So you now know that there was a second letter change that changed this amino acid from one to the other. But the question is, in her BRCA1 gene, which is the same gene Angelina Jolie um, made famous, they've got this amino acid change in a very important part of the gene. The question is, is it pathogenic or not? Is it a cause for this lady's breast cancer? Now, in fact, they have a cousin who also has it, who also has breast cancer, but they have another cousin who got breast cancer at a young age who doesn't have it. So, does that exclude it? Which is quite hard. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the details. The fact is, the literature has said it is, it isn't, it is, it isn't for the last six or seven years for, for mm -hmm. conflicting evidence. So I actually sent their letter, I sent a letter to uh, about a dozen of my colleagues around the country in cancer genetics and said, <laughs> pretend I am a 32-year-old female doctor and I was the daughter of Kathleen there, right? And I want to know whether I should have mastectomies because I've got this mutation. Mm -hmm. And we sent it to five centres, or several centres in Britain. The first four letters we got back gave different opinions. And we sent one to Australia, who reported this variant into a database, and they said, oh, it's, it's non-pathogenic. The truth is, it is pathogenic, and there was a, a mistake published about five years ago that is why it's said not to be pathogenic. So it depends which paper you read as to whether it is or not. Now, clearly, this could be Lynch syndrome, okay? It happens to be a breast, breast cancer family, but can you imagine how disruptive it would be to your families if you all turned up at five different genetic centres and got told it's not pathogenic, it's probably not pathogenic, it might be pathogenic, it's probably pathogenic, or it's definitely pathogenic. Those are the five opinions I elicited for this family in the same week from Britain. 
So we clearly cannot be doing this. And what the reason, that in this case, is a special case, but there's going to be millions of these sorts of problems cropping up. So what we need to create is a database which pools knowledge. And in fact, the reason I, one of the reasons I know that that is pathogenic is that if you look at this particular position in every animal species in the, in the world, everybody's got a BRCA gene because it's a DNA repair gene. And there is a, an equivalent of position 1736. In, right down to worms, at position 1736, there's always a baleen. It's never been anything but a baleen in the whole billion, four billion years of human or life's existence. And that's going to be telling you something. If it wasn't important, why would it stay the same throughout every animal species? So that's the sort of evidence that we can accumulate. So people like Ian, who is clever, as opposed to me, who talks a lot, are all getting together to create curation committees around these genes. Now, in fact, we already did this for the mismatch repair genes, and Ian is one of the leading players in this. So we basically pool knowledge across the whole world, and we have a curation committee, which Ian's part of, that decides on this sort of question behind the scenes that you're not aware of. But it doesn't happen for BRCA. And so the breast cancer genes, last year I, I became involved with a thing called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And I put to them that we should do it for breast cancer because it's such a famous pair of genes. And uh, so the BRCA challenge, which I co-chair, is now pooling data from around the world. Uh, and we're going to create the equivalent of the, uh, the mismatch repair register, the insight uh, register for, uh, for the rest of the world, as a model for all the other 20,000 genes that we need to analyze. Because the latest panel that's been produced for cancer panel has got 94 genes on it. So we haven't even sorted out the half dozen that we're used to. And we've now got another 90 to sort out on top of that. So you can imagine what a challenge this is going to be.